This is um, Joe Natale. It's September 27, 2016, and we are in interviewing Jim Lasargas. Jim is 73 years old, and he was born on March 21, 1943. Um, my name is Joe Natale. And I'm the interviewer. Isaiah Roberts will be the court reporter for this interview. Jim, um, would you please state for the recording in what war and branch of the service were you in? I was in the United States Army and I was in the Army Aviation. Okay, we're going to go back to a little biographical details. Can you tell us ab about yourself and where you were born? I was born right here in Springfield, Illinois, out at the Springfield Hospital out on 5th and North Grand. Well, I went to grade school here in Springfield, went to high school in Springfield, started off in college, and then I was drafted right out of the Springfield here, and I decided to join up and take an extra year for Army Aviation. Okay, where did you, um, what year were you drafted? 1967. Okay. March. So the Vietnam 60, War 69. was going on Yes, then. the Vietnam War okay. had started 65, I believe. How did you feel about being drafted? Well, I knew it was coming because the war was really escalating, and uh, I was ready to go. I wasn't. I was tired of schoolwork. I just wasn't doing my best in school, and uh, I decided uh, the service would be the best place for me, and that's what I did. I just decided when I got drafted to sign up for an extra year, so that I could get into aviation. And that's why you pick that branch of the of yes, the military. Yes, in the helicopters. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what was your first days of like boot camp and service? What was that? Well, my first days. Can I backtrack? Sure, sure. We left. We flew from Fort Benning, Georgia. Our helicopters, sixteen of us, sixteen helicopters, to Stockton, California. We went across the state of Texas, New Mexico, Arizona out in the Pacific Ocean, up the whole coast of California, and into Stockton, California, where we loaded onto aircraft carriers, World War II type aircraft carriers that were run by the Merchant Marines. So we covered, we took all the rotor blades off, loaded all the helicopters down below and up on top, put big white covers over them for the sea salt so it wouldn't mm -hmm. corrosion, and took off for Vietnam, and about 13 or 14 days later we arrived in uncovered everything and put the blades back on and flew the choppers into our base camp that was already set up and uh, the first experience I had I lived in a pup tent for two weeks in it was the dry season and it was dust that was two three inches thick and the wind was blowing and we just ate dust every day it was just miserable conditions until the army engineers came in and made us nice hooches and mm -hmm. got us off the ground and Turned out pretty pretty nice then. So, did you know how to fly a helicopter then? No, I was the crew chief. My main job was just making sure we had everything on the chopper. Everything was in ready condition. There was also a flight engineer who was with me, and his job was to do the motors, the engines, and mm -hmm. transmissions. My job was trans uh, was uh, drive shafts making sure uh, and all the hookups for the picking up the artillery we picked up 105s and 75 artilleries every day and ammunition and relocate them to different positions throughout the jungle area wherever the army or the marines needed them were these big guns oh yeah big yeah hollows or cannons and you just yeah we would, we would hover up and then hook cannon up first take off with it and then underneath they would sling load the uh, ammunition big bags mm -hmm. big tent, nets of uh, ammunition and then we would take off and usually get shot up well, if we had a couple of bullet holes in the rotor blades we'd have to drop our load and then come back in and change the rotor blades out because they were always shooting up at it. anything that the enemy would see that you had a package underneath you you were a target how close were they then to the to your they were base? all throughout the whole jungle uh, Vietnam where we flew at we went up mostly the Cambodia border, and they were in Cambodia. We were just on the border side into Vietnam, going into the different areas. They were all over. And don't forget, from what we understand now, they were lived in tunnels. You can, they mm -hmm. were very, you know, you couldn't spot them, you know. Mm -hmm. And when we would shoot down at them, all you could see through the jungle foliage was just some of their legs and their feet. But the, the jungle was so thick. 
the trees, you know, you couldn't penetrate through them, you know, until the uh, jets would come, the Air Force would come in and do some scraping or bombing ahead of us. So did you do involved in any kind of combat? Well, I was on a lot of rescue missions where some of our choppers had been shot down. This one particular helicopter had been shot down in a rice paddy, and our main job was to go over and rescue, get the guns out of it, get the avionics, there's all the radio equipment, and all the maps and everything. Mm -hmm. As our helicopter landed, it landed on top of a rice paddy, there's roads, there's little square areas. I jumped off the rear ramp, and I jumped right into a rice paddy, and I was stuck. I went all the way to my waist. I couldn't move. At mm. the same time, the enemy had been spotted over there. They started shooting at the helicopter I just jumped out of. Guess what? It takes off and leaves me there. Thank goodness the Marines were in the area, and they came and fortified the area. And the helicopter came back and picked me up. But as I got out of the rice paddy, my boots stayed down there in the mud and the yuck. Mm. My pants stayed, and it stinks so bad because they fertilized everything with the human waste and all the bulls and all the mm -hmm. cows and stuff, you know, that's how they fertilize. And it was an embarrassing moment for me. <laughs> Meanwhile, the other guys went over, the Marines, and they got everything out of that helicopter and blew it up. Okay, I was going to say, did they destroy it? Yeah, they destroyed some... it, yeah. Um, what, was, what was the jungle like? Flying over, it was beautiful. I mean, you, that country over there was just the most beautiful area in the mountains, the rolling mountains and hills, are just beautiful. But down below, the, the, you know, the way the people lived, especially along Saigon and the Saigon River, it was terrible, terrible living conditions. You know, no, no waste of any kind of uh, conditions, you mm -hmm. know, everything was just, uh, I think it's that same way today, I really don't know, but it just... Did the jungle have a smell? Oh, yeah, especially in the rain, in monsoons. When the rain season started, it would rain like six times a day, and you could set your watch to it exactly for two hours. Every two hours, it would rain right on the money. And it rained for 20, 30 minutes and quit. But boy, would it rain, especially in the middle of the monsoon season. Mm -hmm. How long were you in Vietnam? One year to the minute. Exactly <laughs> one year to the minute. Yeah. One year. So, I have a, I have a nice picture right here of my tent that I was in that I lived in. I like to show it to you because, up on top of the roof why there. Why don't you just hold see, it up to the camera? Okay. So uh, we, okay. We, on the people can see. On the next page, on the top of my tent, it says next. On that picture mm -hmm. right there, mm -hmm. that was the next guy to get to leave and go home oh. that, that day. <laughs> Um, how do you, what, before you, you left, you knew how things were here at home, how people felt. Yes. Um, yes. How did the guys over there think about they, they, what they was took going it, on? They, they took it bad. You know, it depends, I think, what city you lived in. When I came back here to Springfield, our colleges were, I believe, just starting. You know, there was there was no college demonstrations mm -hmm. here in Springfield. There was no demonstrations in Springfield. People here, I believe, were for the, you know, were uh, while they were hearing what was going on, they were probably turning a little bit of sympathy against it. But I think for the most part, I, I, I was honored when I came back home and respected, you know. You know, I was just glad to get back home, you mm -hmm. know. Um... Yes, some of the things you you did over there. You mentioned, you know, you put stuff on the helicopters and and got them ready. Mm -hmm. Can you go into a little more detail about that? Yeah, first my my main job, like I said, we had a flight engineer who kind of went over the ship. My job was to do the logbook, make sure everything in that logbook was ready for the officers when they came out to fly the plane. They could check the logbook to make sure what needed to be done, if, make sure the radios were always working. That was the most important thing. you got to have communication when you're flying in that jungle in case anything would happen. Uh, make sure I had plenty of ammunition always in the, in the helicopter. Make sure we had plenty of food for us, and I would have to go to the mess hall every morning. Like I said, I would cut up, get uh, sl big slices of bologna and ham and uh, loaves of bread and uh, just any any snacks that I could get for us to load up for the whole crew, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. in case we were ever uh, had to go down for any reason and be stored out or 
be stopped out in the jungle someplace. Yeah. W were there any casualties in your unit? In we your had unit? a couple, yeah. We had a couple. We had a couple of choppers blowed right out of the sky, yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. Have, have yeah. you been to the wall in, in Washington, D.C.? Yes, D. C.? yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I was on the honor flight, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. When did you do the honor flight? Uh, a year ago last June. Okay. And the honor flight is out of Springfield Capital Airport. They yes, fly, it was. Uh, War veterans to see that. Yes, it was a war. very exciting trip. Also, I was stationed in Washington. When I got back out of Vietnam, I was picked along with my uh, helicopter that I was with to fly into Washington, D.C., right out of the Pentagon for three months and cover the race riots. We covered the race riots. I have a picture here of a helicopter with a big camera inside that slid out of the helicopter where the guy, the cameraman, could take pictures of the race riots going on in Washington, D.C., around the whole area. And he would monitor everything back into the Pentagon so the Army Chiefs of Staff could view and see what was going on and where they needed to call, call out the Army, the uh, National Guard troops that were surrounded, the whole Washington, D.C. area. They didn't keep them in the city, in the center of the city, because that would just cause more problems. They kept them out in case they needed them to call them in to quiet down certain areas that just got out of hand. Now, would that have, what year would that have been? Was that? 68, 69. Okay. 68, 69, yeah. Was it after Martin Luther King was killed? Yes. Okay. Yes, I believe it Yeah. Because he was that. April of mm -hmm. 1968, and there were riots then. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I believe it was right at that time, April, yeah, because okay. I still had one year to go with from April, well, from March to March of uh, 69. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did you have, you make close friendships when you were there in Vietnam? Yes. Yeah, I, I really did. But the problem was there, you know, you just as soon as you meet somebody, the guys in my company were transferred. Every three months, the guys, I was very lucky, very fortunate that I got to stay with the same company the whole year in Vietnam at Barakat. But a lot of my best friends were transferred to different areas uh, every three months because of the rotation of the soldiers, so many coming and going, and different uh, companies would need different qualified people, you know, different crew chiefs or different uh, uh, engine men or uh, transmission people, you know, whoever, you know, they needed. So just as soon as you learn somebody, they'd, he'd get a paper and he'd get a transfer and, you, you know, and you mentioned Bearcat, where you were based. Can you tell us about... Well, yeah, Bearcat was right in the middle of... Well, it was 20 miles north of Saigon. It was right in the middle of the jungle. The uh, Army engineers came in there and sprayed out that whole area with the Agent Orange, killed all the foliage. And then the bulldozers came in and made a big berm, made big walls around it. And we had Marines for guards. And then the uh, Army engineers also made a big, beautiful flight uh, 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 deck or a flight, the uh, place for the helicopters mm -hmm. to land with big revetment walls that uh, we could store our helicopters in too. So they would, when we would get rockets in every night, one or two, just for harassment, just to keep you, you know, just as soon as you fall asleep, there they come, you know, just to keep you on your toes. My last three months in country, I slept in a bunker because I didn't want to sleep in the tent. I was scared if anything would happen. So we had our tents lined up in these big bunkers and we put electricity down there, one light bulb down there so we could see just to get in and go to sleep. Um, did you ever get, um, did you ever get any leave when you were there? Or was it yes, just... yes I did. I got a 10 day leave to go to Singapore. And it was wonderful to get out of Vietnam to 10 days to go to Singapore. Singapore is one of the most beautiful countries I've ever seen in my life. The city itself was just as modernized as Chicago, Illinois was at that time. I was never so impressed. It was big high mountains and uh, just a beautiful skyscraper city. It was just white sandy beaches with yachts all over, big ships, boats. It was beautiful. And I met a, I met a, a New Zealander officer that took me on tour and showed me the whole area of Singapore, which he knew of, and I was very fortunate to meet him and have a good time. Uh, did you go into the USO shows or anything? Oh, I like saw Bob Hope, saw yeah, Bob yeah, Hope. I got to see him. He came to uh, Benoit Air Base. We got to fly in there to see him. 
couple of thousand soldiers all lined mm-hmm. up on the mountainside. So, yeah, it was an exciting day just to go and watch him, you know. You, um, how about, like, your the, the food you ate while you were there? Or? We had good food, believe it or not. We had a, after, well, after the first uh, three weeks to a month, we lived out of just the food trucks. They had just uh, drove in food trucks, but then the mess hall was being built. And it was really an elaborate mess hall. They made the best for us. And our breakfast, dinners, and lunches were really good. But I was always flying. You know, we were always, mm-hmm. every day, you know, we were out in the air. And we ate a lot of lunch meats and, you know, until we get back in for supper time. And then we'd always get a good meal. And we were treated pretty good, all the crew chiefs and all the officers, were, because we were always coming and going. So we didn't have to wait in line for anything. We got right in and got what we needed. And the mess halls knew us, you know what I mean? The cooks mm-hmm. and all could, that. I know we might be retreading some old ground, but could, what was like a typical day like? Like when you got up to when you went to bed? Getting up was usually right at uh, 4, 4.30. Getting dressed, going to get the ammunition first for myself, my own personal sidearms and my rifle. And then going right to the mess tent to the mess hall and getting the lunch meat, putting it all into bags and getting on my little bicycle and driving it down a couple of blocks to the flight line and uh, meeting the flight engineer and getting the engine started up and checking everything, uh, all the power and the radios, making sure everything was online and ready for flight. Then the officers would show up and they would do a pre-inspection of the ship itself too, you know what I mean? Making sure everything was fastened down tight and all the doors and everything were locked. And, and these, would, these would be the pilots? These would be okay. the pilots. They do the same inspection we did every day. You know, Usually when we fly in every night, we'd give it a quick fix because the officers who are flying, they could feel some of the vibrations. In a Chinook helicopter, when you're picking up a big load, you have nothing but vibration. It sounds like the whole ship's ready to fall apart. But that's just the way the frames and everything are made to give a little bit. Mm-hmm. It's supposed to have a lot of... Uh, buoyance or leniency mm-hmm. into it, you know, flexibility. But uh, you can tell the engines that are at full strain when they're when they're picking up a big heavy load. And uh, our problem was we could only fly maybe 60 knots, which is maybe uh, 75, 80 mile an hour in, in car speed. And we were a sitting target up in the air. And it was and, a big target too. Oh, big it? target, yeah. Uh, we fly average between 3,000, not much more than 3,500 feet. You know, it's just uh, the air got the, the higher you go with the more load, the air gets thinner and thinner, and the blades just can't keep your load up. Hmm. Now, if you're not carrying anything and you're just flying, you can get up six, seven thousand, you know, feet and and, uh, and go pretty good. Okay, we're talking typical day. So then you, you do everybody's doing their inspections. Yep. And then then what happens? Then you try to fly in some of these areas we flew in to put the uh, artillery down in the jungle was tight. I mean tight. And we would have to come down pretty low and you're hovering the whole time and you're hovering down low, low, low. Well, we called Charlie. We called him the enemy Charlie at that Mm -hmm. time and Charlie would be over there taking a pop shot now and then, you know. And you just hope he didn't hit a roller blade and mess uh, the balance and everything Mm -hmm. up. Were, were they just shooting at the helicopter? Were they shooting it, for the pilot or, shoot, or just shooting at, at the, the ship? Just shooting okay. at the ship, trying to destroy it, knock it out, you know. We had a lot of protection uh, around the engine, a lot of our, 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 our steel and stuff. Another thing is, when we first flew off the aircraft carriers, we had B-model Chinook helicopters. As soon as we landed in the Vietnam at the air base there, we got brand new D-model helicopters that came in, and I don't know where they came from. They just showed up, so they took our old ones and transferred them. And mm-hmm. we got newer these. The newer D models had more armament on them, better protection on the floorboards, especially where the uh, officers, the pilots sat. They had a lot of protection, a lot of steel, a lot of a uh, tedlar, I guess you'd call it, around mm-hmm. it. You know. Okay, so yeah. you're out doing a mission. And then how long would that take? Well, let me tell you about one particular mission. We had a group of UEs behind us. Those are helicopters? UE helicopters, yeah. mm-hmm. They were carrying the Marines and the Army so, uh, soldiers. 
we had about six Chinook helicopters carrying artillery, and we had Huey Cobra helicopters out in front giving us protection. All of a sudden, we're flying along, and uh, the Air Force had been out in front of us with B-52s, saturating the whole jungle area with bombs. You could feel the concussion up in the sky from all the bombs that were being dropped down onto the ground. I mean, they just land based of it to where there was, you wouldn't think there'd be anything left. Well, all of a sudden, a ground air missile came up and shot one of the helicopters right out of the sky, right out in front of us. And we saw the thing go up. Mm -hmm. And we continued the mission, a little, the mission a little further, and pretty soon another rocket came up, knocked the second one out that was ahead of us, out right out of the sky. Then they got on the radios and called them, the, they call it a sortie, that was mm -hmm. the name of the mission. They would call it back and we went back to camp and turned around just flew back in and landed and that was the end of that mission so because of the just, loss of two helicopters ahead of us. Okay. Yeah. Because they, they couldn't do what the, in the time like an airstrike or anything like that. They'd already because, been doing what they called the Air Force back in. Uh -huh. I was told the Air Force came back in. But you know when you get a couple of snipers, you know one person with a ground air rocket you, you can't you find him, you can't see him, you don't know where they're at. You know, so they're, that's what shot him down. A, right, like that's, a shoulder what, held that's what we're assuming it was. Yeah, one of those shoulder rocket, you know. Mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. the, the big stuff, the big that you see on TV, where there are three or four of them that come out, those are stationed up in uh, 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 Hanoi, I believe, where they mm -hmm. shot the big jet planes down. Mm -hmm. But just the helicopters, they just had these little armed arm uh, rocket launchers that they just, you know, an individual could shoot and, and knock something out of the sky. All right, on, on a day that a, a, a mission, I guess, went well, you just, you fly in and... Fly in and get, unload, unload your uh, load, set it down, pick up and go right back to the base camp and say a prayer that you're safe and you could land, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you dropped something then, or made a, del I don't, a delivery, a delivery. Yeah. I don't know if that's the proper term, yeah. I wanted to mean what you did, but um, there would be soldiers there. Oh yes, the oh yes. Yeah, it would, uh, it would be a good, good, good secure area for the most part. But after a while, the, along the Cambodia and Vietnam borders, like I said, the, the, the North Vietnamese and the uh, regulars came down from from the north down through Cambodia side so we couldn't go over there to you know shoot mm -hmm. them we were not allowed to you know it's political the way it was and uh, they could filter right in at any point and you never knew where they were coming in so uh, it got pretty bad the last three months that I was there in the country like I said it was pretty bad and the, the regular now there was also the Viet Cong, right? The, yeah, they were the locals. The Viet Cong the, would, were the locals. They would be the local, okay. yeah, the Viet Cong. Then the uh, there were Chinese regulars, but I I don't think we saw too many of them. They usually fought the Marines up at Da Nang and all that, mm -hmm. way through by and all that, way up north. I was very lucky we never got to go way up north. We stayed right in the Saigon, Pleiku area, which was just east and west, back and forth. You know. So when did you leave Vietnam? I left it in March the 1st of 68. Went over in March 1st okay. of 67. So you, To the minute. I will never forget it. You, right you, you were there then during the Tet Offensive in yes. Jane. What was that like? Yes. It, uh, they, it just hit the city of Saigon. Like I said, we were 20 miles north. I was stationed the, in the 9th... Uh, Army Infantry Company was stationed at our Bar at our Barakat, my base camp, and they had to go into Saigon to uh, quiet, you know, to help the soldiers mm -hmm. in there. And it was just a scurvy, it was a hit and run tactics on the Tet Offensive. I think it only lasted two or three days mm -hmm. and until they were all wiped out or, or run out. Did I didn't get to see uh, ground action, I really didn't see too much of. Only if our choppers or we were on a rescue mission to go down and get to mm -hmm. get a rescue. You know what I mean? Did the did you guys think, oh, oh boy, something's really wrong here with with that Tet offensive? Like Every day at home. Every day you would think that okay. something is wrong. Why aren't we winning this war? Why? Why we've got this? 
the power. We got everything here. Why aren't we winning? Okay. That was the question for everybody. Why aren't we winning? And I don't know if I should say this or not, but to be an officer and to get into a helicopter and just take off and fly, knowing that you, that might be your last few minutes on earth, you know, why wasn't it more secured? You know, just, just why, you know. Hmm. Let me tell you one more story that just come to my mind. We were on a rescue mission and we had just changed the rotor blades on the chopper that had been shot down. And uh, the Marines came over. They were just on the hillside on the other side. And they said, men, get off that helicopter right now. We're going to fire one of our big cannons. And the concussion of this cannon will knock you off that ship if you don't get off of it. Sure enough, we got down on the ground and they fired this big long cannon. I don't know what they call it, but it's one of the biggest ones that the Army made. And sure enough, it shook the ground and it rocked. So we get back on the helicopters, but they didn't tell us there was a second one over there. And they fired it, and well, sure enough, we come jumping off that helicopter <laughs> when they fired it, because it went right over our heads, and I thought that was the end of everything then, you know. And they all laugh at us, you know, and giggle, you know. The Marines were, they were a tough bunch of guys. One particular night, I had post guard. In other words, I had to go out to the bunker areas at the main, the main berm wall, with the four Marines who were, that was their job every night, they were on guard duty. Well, you can imagine sticking one Army guy from aviation and with a bunch of infantry Marines, they would harass me for the first hour and scare me to death, you know what I mean? Every sound that was going out out in the jungle, I would jump up and get on a night vision mm -hmm. goggles and look out there, and they would all laugh and giggle at you, you know, but uh, usually what it was was the little ladies from the villages outside of our base camp would come into our garbage areas and they'd pick up all the extra pieces that were thrown out there, you know, anything they could sal salvage and take back to the, their little villages. Um, when, you, when you came, what did you do when you came home? What did you do with your life? <laughs> well, I, I finished up school and I, I was good friends at that time with our mayor here in Springfield. And he appointed me, he said, if you go back out to Lincoln Green's golf course, I'll give you a job out there. So which, I went back. Which to mayor is this? Mayor Mike Houston. Okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, I went out to Lincoln Green's golf course and had to go back to school to get a degree in turf management. And I stayed there for 30 years working at Lincoln Green's and had an enjoyable, great time. That was a... The, the course there is really green. I mean, it's, it was, it's it was turned, good... Since the park district came in and who are professional golf people mm -hmm. and took over, I hated to retire. I had it made. We had a brand new clubhouse they built for us, put in a brand new two new ponds, a new irrigation system, and it was beautiful. The grounds were really starting to shape up. Before, under the city control, money was never allocated for the golf course because there were too many other things in mm -hmm. the city that needed repair and needed money and I can understand you know what was going on and when the park district decided to come in and take over all the golf courses which they should have years and years ago under recreation it uh, just improved the place the quality of did, did any of the skills you learned in the military help you with that very job? very much very much uh, I got to work a lot with a machinist making different parts and stuff you know and uh, a lot of my trades I learned in the service I brought back to the golf course at the golf course was like taking care of a little city we took care of everything in the clubhouse the, from the main road all the way in all winter long we would work you know work on golf cars work on tractors work on the uh, mowing equipment you know everything painting Cleaning up everything, getting so it ready like for spring. So it's like a military base. Exactly. About yeah. how many acres is that? Do you know? Uh, what were we? 240 acres we were. Okay. And that's an 18 course. Mm, 18. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you go to any reunions or anything oh, like that? Oh, yes, yes. We've got a, got a high school reunion coming up right now. Our 50 years. Uh, October the 21st, I believe it is. Landfair High okay. School. Mm -hmm. Any military reunions? Or? No. No. Uh, my company, when, when I left Vietnam, I found out that my company was going way up north. 
And when I, the next thing I found out, they dispersed the 200th aviation. They stopped it. It, it went out. Mm -hmm. And that's all I ever heard. I had these magazines that I get a hold of, and I write in all the time to find out if I get any inf information from some of the other guys. But no one ever has answered an article, or no one's ever answered. Do you belong to any, um, like VFW or American, American Legion? American Legion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, I just, we just go there to have a little lunch, and I don't attend too many meetings. Mm -hmm. I'm always something's. And the family's always something going. I come from a large family, and we're always doing something or going someplace or getting ready to go to Branson next week. Mm -hmm. So what do you do in your retirement? Uh, I work a lot around the house. I, I do a lot of volunteer work at my church. I do a lot of work there. What church is that? Southside Christian okay. Church on South MacArthur here in Springfield. Okay. We're in a complete remodeling process right now, redoing the whole church right now. Yeah. Is is there any other thing you wanna I didn't ask and you wanna bring up or I think important? I pretty well covered it. I, I really appreciated the honor flight people for starting this service for all the veterans. I think it was just a terrific time. Especially meeting all the different guys from World War Two, the Korean War, the Vietnam War. It was we had a great day. That was just an enjoyable day. I mean, some of these gentlemen were in wheelchairs, and they were pretty old and pretty tired. You know what I mean? But th it was like a second childhood to them again when we got so, into Washington. So when, when we might as well talk about when you when you get there on the honor flight, where do you what do you do, or it, how does it? I'm going to tell you. As soon as you get off the airplane, as you're pulling into the taxi, and there's two giant fire trucks fire trucks out there, and they're shooting water over the top of the helicopter or over the top of the airplane. To welcome us as we land in, and they're giving us honor as we as we come what in. What airport do you fly into? Is it Reagan uh, or Dulles? Or? Reagan, yeah, okay. Reagan, Air, mm -hmm, Reagan. And uh, they unload us. We come right out of the airplane into the terminal, right on the buses. They had three buses lined up, right at the front door. We get right on them, and we start right at the World War II Museum. They take us right up to the front door. And our state representative, Rodney Davis, was there to meet us and shake hands with all of us guys. And we could see the World War II, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War all together. Mm -hmm. Then we load up and we went to the Air Force uh, Memorial, which is outstanding and beautiful. Then we went and saw the uh, Army, uh, the I mean the Aviation uh, Museum there, which is outstanding. But the best part of the whole trip is going to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier and watching the flag being brought down for taps. So in the evening? Then. In the evening time, mm-hmm. And uh, as we're all sitting there, they have these big steps that in front of the unknown tomb mm -hmm. right there. As you're sitting down there and you're watching the uh, lieutenant come out to change the guard. As he's walking across to get the guard to change him, he trips and he kind of falls. But he does that in respect to all the veterans that are sitting up in the stands. And we didn't know that until they told us afterwards, you know, he says, that's respect for the soldiers who are sitting up in the stands. But he does it so neat. He just, you know. He, 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 he like he trips. Tri he, like he skips and he trips, you know what I mean? Like, Is, What's the meaning of that? Do just you? respect for the soldiers, just for the veterans hmm. who are sitting up in the, in the. And then he picks himself, you know, he don't fall around. Yeah, yeah. He picks himself up and he's right back at attention and huh. goes and gets the guard. He checks his weapon real good and. They change, you know, mm -hmm. and go back. Yeah, okay. but that's the only time they do that when they have veterans who are in the in the audience, you know, and are viewing this. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And then one more thing, right across the street, there's the tomb of Audie Murphy, which he's always been a big fan of mine in, in the movies. And I went over and saw his grave marker, and he really had a story there of how, what kind of a hero he really was in the World War Two, and the. Uh, accomplishments that he had done you know okay. he made it a great day just made it a wonderful and then when he came back home um, what happened we landed at the capitol airport here and there was at least 500 to 600 people there just greeting us and they stood up and clapped the governor was there uh, more representatives uh, all city officials were there and all the families of all the soldiers my grandkids were crying, and just uh, my wife, and it was, it was touching. It, it you know, it uh, it was an uh, 
honorable day. Okay. Well, Enjoyable. we appreciate you taking the time. We appreciate what you've done for us, and uh, wish you the best. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Glad to be back home.